Shalom Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today I would like to share with you on the topic of what is called supersessionism or replacement theology. This teaching here is the idea that there is something, a distinct, separate people group from the nation of Israel, and they are now the people of Yahweh. In other words, Yahweh has now ended his relationship with the nation of Israel as a whole, as a nation. All right. They're no longer his people. They don't have any promises left to them, no blessings promised left to them. Okay, they've been rejected. They've been outcast. Some people say they've been divorced, even though Yahweh says, I hate divorce. Um, they are no longer, you know, the land doesn't really belong to them anymore. Okay, that's all ended. And largely, they'll say, due to their rejection of Yeshua. Them rejecting Yeshua is why Yahweh has made that final decision. He's finally had it with them, okay? And so this teaching, I believe, is false. It can't stay consistent within scripture, okay? It is a performance of eisegesis. It's a great example of eisegesis, okay? And you have to basically pull things out of context, out of the historical context in order to get this theology. And you have to not understand what covenants are. In the first century and prior to you can't understand the abrahamic covenant you can't understand the many different covenants okay the davidic covenant the covenant at sinai the uh, levitical priest covenant that it was made there's so many covenants a sand covenant uh i'm sorry a salt covenant a sandal covenant all of these other covenants that are all throughout the bible you have to totally not understand those covenants you have to be misleading in those covenants in order to come up with some type of ideology called supersessionism or replacement theology, okay? And unfortunately, what you actually are doing is you are calling Yahweh a liar. You are calling him a liar because you're saying he will not fulfill his promises to Israel that he has promised all throughout the Tanakh. Now, when I use the word Tanakh, all right, it's an acronym. The T is for Torah, the N is for Nevi'im, and the K is for Ketuvim. It's how I talk about the Hebrew scriptures, okay? The first five books of Moses is the Torah. Then you have the writings of the prophets. And then whatever is left over after that goes into what is called the writings. And that makes up all of the Hebrew scriptures there prior to Yeshua coming, okay? Uh, many within Western Christianity call it the old covenant scriptures. I don't like that term uh, because it, it carries a lot of baggage with it that is misleading, okay? So Tanakh is a better term that you'll hear me using. Now, replacement theology, okay, I believe began right there in the area of Rome early on in the first century, okay? It began to take root, it began to get birth, and that's why we have the Book of Romans. The Book of Romans is to help take care and solve the issue of what was going on with the assemblies there, thinking that possibly maybe they are the true people of Yahweh, and Yahweh is replacing Israel. And so that's why we have chapters 9 through 11 when it's done in its proper context, is to assure us that Yahweh's covenant with Israel stands and it will never go away. She is the bride. She is the bride. And the fact that there are ethnic Jews that believe in Yeshua proves that she is still the bride. Okay, this does not mean or guarantee that all who are ethnically Jews are the bride or all are part of the covenant. No, okay. That's not how salvation works. Salvation is by faith and by grace in the work of Yeshua, okay? Even those who hold to supersessionism hold to that, okay? So there are things we will agree on when it comes to salvation in Yeshua, amen? But they go way too far to say that that now has replaced the nation of Israel. There's a lot of blanket statements that happen, okay? And so let me explain a little bit of this before we really get into it. I got to lay a foundation even though this is not going to be exhaustive, okay, I can't do an exhaustive teaching on this unless I make many, many different parts, okay, but I just want to go ahead and do one teaching on this just to give you an idea, lay a foundation here, okay, so not at all exhaustive what I'm about to share with you. One thing that we have to know and understand in the first century is there was not one Judaism, there were Judaisms, and this is something that many within Western Christianity just don't get, okay, when Yeshua came, he lived Judaism sinlessly. He lived the Torah and he lived first century Judaism. 
And then there were many corrections that he made to their doctrines, but he never forsook it. And neither did any of the first century believers, nor the writers of the new covenant scriptures. They never taught you to forsake the Judaism that Yeshua lived and taught. Okay. All first century assemblies of Yahweh, of Yeshua, uh, were entrenched and foundationally based on Judaism, the Judaism that Yeshua taught. Okay. This is foundational. And this is not something that replacement theology will teach you. They'll teach you that Yeshua forsook Judaism. Okay. That he was trying to get rid of it. That after his death and resurrection, that it was to be forsaken, gone, done away with. And that is a false teaching we find nowhere in the writings of Paul or any of the New Covenant scriptures. Okay. Yes, Western Christianity, those who hold to supersessionism, we also have to understand that's not all of Western Christianity. Okay. Western Christianity has different sects of Christianity within it. And they'll often point fingers at each other and say, well, you're not a real Christian. You're not a real Christian group but yet they all call themselves Christians. So when we're talking about the nation of Israel, we can't just make a blanket statement about the Jews believe this, the Jews believe that. Judaism of the first century was all this way. No, there were many different sects of Judaism. Same thing with Western Christianity. I have to put it in the, the box that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of different denominations, different ways, different doctrines. They don't all agree, okay? Not all of them hold to supersessionism and replacement theology. So uh, we have to be careful when we do blanket statements in that direction also, to not include everybody in that sense, okay? So something to be aware of because oftentimes for people to get their point across, they will make blanket statements that will be found not true when you put everyone in that category, okay? Let me give you this example here. Um, so today in America, all right, we have different presidents that come in and out, right? We vote them in, they, we vote new ones in, right? They all have different ideologies. They, have, they bring up different people in the government. They put people, different people in power. They cause America to go in different directions, okay? And not everyone in America agrees with everything that each president has done throughout history, nor do they want that to represent them as America. Though the world stage says, oh yeah, America's doing this, America's doing that. But yet there would be hundreds of thousands, if not millions within the country that don't agree with the direction of the government that won't follow that direction and live that way. OK, uh, and so that's the way it also is with Israel. Israel had leadership within the first century whom Yeshua rebuked, amen, and warned of a coming judgment pending on the nation because of their work. But that would not necessarily involve every single person within the nation because tens of thousands of believers of Yeshua in the first century were Jews, were Jews. Just read Acts chapter 21, myriads, tens of thousands of Jews came to believe in Yeshua, okay, in the first century. The assemblies of Yeshua were dominantly Jewish, okay, until after maybe 100 CE or so. That's when the tide began to turn, okay, because of the destruction of the temple, had long happened and some other things were going on within the Roman Empire, not to mention uh, the Jewish revolt, the Bar Kukva revolt that happens in the 130s there helps divide more of Gentile and Jews. And so there is that shift that happens. But in the very beginning, when the scriptures were being written and who they were being written to, it was dominantly Jewish believers. So we have to be careful about blanket statements about the Jews this, the Jews that. Just like I can't say all Western Christianity believes this. They don't all believe in supersessionism and replacement theology, but a large number does. And we can see it within the scriptures and throughout history. There's much blood on the hands of many Western Christian denominations because of their theology and supersessionism uh, belief, the replacement theology belief. Okay. Much atrocity and wickedness has happened because of this doctrine all in the name of being a Christian, all in the name of Christianity, okay? So some like to point the finger that, oh yeah, the Jews were the Christ killers. The Jews rejected Yeshua, okay? So they have a partial truth going on there, partial truth. They're trying to drive home their theology in that way. So they make these big blanket statements, 
Okay. Yes, the leadership rejected Yeshua, but not all of Jews rejected Yeshua. Okay. Yes, there's much blood on the hands of Western Christian leaders because of replacement theology, those who held to it and drove and helped drive, you know, much persecution and death and slaughtering of ethnic Jews. So there is evil on both sides because of leadership that have uh, misled people and taken power in a misguided way and also misinterpreted the scriptures. Amen. And so we can't make blanket, blanket statements on the others. We have to look to scripture and say, what has Yahweh said? Did Yahweh predict that the nation of Israel would reject Yeshua as far as leadership would? Yes, it's been, it was predicted. It was understood. Amen. And so we're going to look and see, did that mean that Yahweh forsook the nation of Israel? Or would he raise up in the future righteous leaders that would follow Yeshua, that would represent the nation of Israel, bringing the nation of Israel into its proper covenant promises and the prophecies spoken of, of what Israel would do in the latter days, in the end times? I say yes. Amen. But we have to understand that this idea of replacement theology, we can see it birthed right there in the book of Romans. It was being birthed in the land of Rome, in the assemblies there. All right. And the letter, okay, in general is going to be rejected by those assemblies. At first, they're probably going to take it in and begin to work it, begin to look at it, begin to try and make changes and everything, but it never firmly takes root in those assemblies. Because by the time you get to the second, third, and fourth century, okay, that area, that power structure of there, of those assemblies there in Rome becomes so powerful, and their ideology of replacement theology becomes the dominant view of the land by the fourth century. And by the fourth century, it becomes law of the land, that they are the new people of Yahweh, and that Israel has been firmly rejected. And that firmly established doctrine there becoming law of the land in the fourth century never fully gets reversed. All right. It's still prevalent in many denominations, not all, but many denominations today in Western Christianity and is an extremely dangerous teaching to follow. Okay. Dangerous teaching to follow. And we're going to see more of what I mean by that today. Okay. So sorry for the long introduction. I did have to take about 12, 13 minutes to bring this out. Um, and so let's go to the PowerPoint so you can see more of what I'm trying to say to you so that I can establish this. Um, I'm going to use you know, a vast amount of scriptures, and I'm going to show you uh, a conversation uh, and some comments made by a Western Christian that you can tell by his comments and everything that he holds to supersessionism. Okay, and then we can see how this, you know, misunderstanding, this, this misunderstanding of covenants, this eisegesis that takes place when someone has this mindset. Amen. So here we start out with the PowerPoint, and we're also going to be going to many scriptures here, so we'll be bouncing back and forth. But my PowerPoint title here states, Why Supersessionism Cannot Stand in Scripture. And so I'm going to give you a basic understanding on why it can't. Okay. And again, a large portion of Western Christianity holds to this doctrine. Right? Not all, but a large portion does. Now, this all kind of got started, this video or teaching that I wanted to do on this topic um, from uh, this post that I did, uh, and it kind of sparked a conversation going on, which helped me to spark this, um, this video here. So I stated that, remember Nineveh, okay, the story of Jonah or Yonah, has been the only Gentile city or nation spared destruction for a period because they repented as a nation from their sins, all right? As far as an example in the Tanakh passages, uh, unless I'm missing something, this is the only nation or city as a whole that was a Gentile nation, not, not someone who had a covenant with Yahweh, that heard the prophet Yonah speak and believed him and began to repent to Yahweh for their sins, okay? Other than that, Israel is the only nation promised eternal existence. No nation in the Bible has a covenant relationship with Yahweh. So they're not promised what eternal existence. No other nation, not even America, England, 
you know, China, Japan, Russia, whatever, you know, whatever country you want to name, only Israel, because of the promises made to Abraham, is promised an eternal existence. Okay. So that is something that is factual and found in scripture. Okay. And so I was just making this statement uh, largely because oftentimes you see people state, well, we have something called the church now. And, you know, the nation of Israel, well, that's separate. Okay. And we have something called the church. Okay. That is even a uh, misleading or a misled teaching, I should say, that's not coherent in scripture. It can't be consistently brought forth in scripture, okay? Because when we talk about Israel, they were betrothed at Mount Sinai. They were given the covenants, the promises, amen? And Paul is going to make it very clear, as I state here in my comment here, in Romans 9 through 11, which is what we're going to talk about too a little bit later, that he is trying to reverse the theology that is taking place there in the assemblies of Rome. They are coming up with this idea of maybe they've replaced Israel. And he is going to firmly establish, no, you have not. No, you have not. Israel is still the people of Yahweh. And just because there are unbelieving Israelites, there are unbelieving Jews, all right, that does not mean that Yahweh has forsaken Israel. Okay. And so we, we, can, we can show you different passages where it states that if part of the lump is holy, the entire lump is holy, set apart unto Yahweh, okay? The fact that Paul is an ethnic Jew, all right, and that ethnic Jews were dominant within the believers of Yeshua of the first century is fact enough that Yahweh has never forsaken Israel, that they are still the people of Yahweh, that he is fulfilling them. Uh, their, their promises, their calling, amen. And we're going to talk about how their gifts and callings are irrevocable. So, but there's a lot to explain on that. So one of the reasons for the statement was to spark this conversation and, and let people know, begin to, you know, just drop some, some proper hints that if you think that God, Yahweh has forsaken Israel, you're sadly mistaken. They are the only ones that have prom been promised eternal existence, okay? The nation has. It's just, it's not something they deserve. It's not something that, it's just by Yahweh's grace, by his sovereign choice, he chose the nation of Israel and said they will never cease to exist. And I'll show you scripture that says that, okay? So all those who have faith in Yeshua can be grafted into Israel and her adoptions, glory, covenants, promises, Torah, etc. We see that in Romans chapter 9. And we're going to read that here uh, sometime in this teaching. So if you are a Gentile, there's not something separate called the church. Okay, You are grafted into Israel and her promises. So the body of Messiah is something inside of Israel. It's not something outside of Israel. Okay. Because of the promises and the covenants, this is a fact. This cannot be erased. But Western Christianity in general, not all, but in general, has tried to reverse this, has tried to uh, say that this is not true, and they've created something called the church. Okay, We're going to talk about that word church and how that is even misleading. It, it brings confusion. Okay. Uh, oftentimes it brings confusion to the truth of the scriptures. And it is a word that is brought in later because replacement theology has already been firmly established. Okay, so let me just say this. The ecclesia of Yeshua, Yeshua talks about the ecclesia, his ecclesia, okay? That word simply just means assembly or congregation in the Greek. In the first century, there was no word called the church, Okay. But because of replacement theology, by the time we get to our English Bibles, okay, this word has now been instituted into the translations, and it's slowly over time that that happens because of theology, not because of truth, but because of theology, a specific doctrine that people hold to. And so all throughout the Tanakh, the word ecclesia is used when it's talking about Yahweh's people and his covenant, it's talking about Israel. Okay, the word ecclesia, he is assembly, and that is the assembly of Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who was betrothed to Israel at Mount Sinai. 
Okay, he is the one that is the angel of Yahweh that led them through the desert for 40 years and spoke to them, spoke to Moshe face to face. He made the covenant there with the father, with the Ruach HaKodesh at Mount Sinai. Israel is the bride and he will discipline his bride. Amen. And he will cast out people who are inside of Israel if they are walking in unbelief. He will cast them out, but he will never utterly cast the nation away. There will always be a remnant. Okay. Though the number of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, only in what a remnant will be saved, but that remnant will represent the nation of Israel. It will receive her promises, her covenant promises. Okay. So this is very important. This is what this whole statement here was sparking, was to bring back truth that Israel is the bride. Okay. And so that's why it says Yeshua will reign as king from Zion, Zion, from Jerusalem. All right, and I give you scripture stating that Yeshua will reign from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, which represents Israel. It's the capital of Israel. That's exactly what these scriptures are stating. Okay, this will tell you that Israel will never fade away, that Israel is the bride, that there isn't something called the church. Okay, because he's reigning from there. Now, as Gentiles, scripture is clearly going to show that. We're always part of the bride. We're always part if we are. Why? Because salvation is by faith. So coming out of Israel was both Jews and Gentiles. And that's not often stated or taught. So when Moshe left Mitzrayim, left Egypt, everyone left by faith. This is salvation by grace and by faith right here, a picture. And it was two people groups that left, Jews or Israelites, Hebrews, okay, and Gentiles, okay? Just look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 37 and 38. When they came to Mount Sinai, what made up the nation of Israel with both Jews and Gentiles, or Israelites, Hebrews and Gentiles, they were all standing there together, making up the nation of Israel, making up the bride, okay? And it was all done by faith. Anyone who wanted to connect themselves to Israel belonged to Israel. Okay, and there's much I can say on that. Uh, there's many passages within the Torah that state that there is one law for the native and the foreigner. Okay, and so we have to define that and look at that, but they all made up the nation of Israel. Okay, and it's the same for the new covenant. The new covenant does not change that fact. Okay, but we have to understand that, and Paul's going to firmly teach this in the book of Romans that Gentiles are grafted into the nation of Israel. But those who hope, hold to supersessionism have to change the name of the tree. They have to change the name of the olive tree to something else. And they'll call it Abraham's tree, okay? Which again, is a twisting of scripture in order for their theology. So I stated this statement here and uh, I've stated many statements, okay? I'm always making statements on how Israel is the bride. It's a constant thing that I often do because I want to drop seeds of the truth to people so that they can begin to understand the truth. Okay. And so uh, there was a Western Christian who you can tell by what he's saying, uh, holding to supersessionism. And he states this, I sometimes marvel at the pride shown by Jewish Christians as if their status is anything more than a result of Abraham's faith. All right, so there's, this is a loaded question here, a blanket statement, okay? Who knows how many Jewish Christians he, he actually knows? Don't know, but this is a, he's making an attack on a particular group of people who are ethnically Jewish and yet call themselves Christians. And yes, he may have run across some uh, of them that are prideful, okay? But I've run across many Western Christians that are prideful. I run across Christians all the time that are prideful. We're all, I've had moments of pride that I have to repent from and deal with, all right? We all deal with pride. And so, yes, there are, in some cases, ethnic Jews who are prideful because of their ethnicity. That was what a lot that happened in the first century. The first century was about, uh, oftentimes, with the Jewish leaders, they were so prideful in their bloodline. They thought they were saved by their bloodline, okay? Their bloodline, their actual physical circumcision and their bloodline said that they were saved, that they had a place in the world to come. And 
Yeshua was straightening out that false understanding to the Jewish leaders. That was something that grew over time and became foundational in the first century. Even Paul had to repent from it. Okay. But this has no bearing on Yahweh's promises to Israel. And so, yes, you are going to find some people who believe that their ethnicity uh, is something to be prideful over. Okay. But this is a blanket statement. Not all ethnic Jews believe this way. And oftentimes, when we are speaking truthful statements about the Torah, how the Torah has not been done away with, okay? Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19 firmly states that Yeshua did not come to abolish the Torah or the words of the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. That word fulfill means properly teach and understand and live along with what? Being the reality of what those things point to, okay? He's going to become the reality of what those offerings, that whole offering system and everything points to. Okay. So he's fulfilling it in that way, but that doesn't mean end. He says it won't end until all is fulfilled. Well, he's coming back a second time. He's returning a second time. And there's so many promises made to the nation of Israel in the Tanakh that have not been fulfilled yet, that he will forgive them of all their iniquities. Okay. There are many passages that hold that. We're going to see that today. I'm going to show you some of that. There's promises made to the nation of Israel that have not been fulfilled. So all of the Torah is valid and viable for all believers in Yeshua today. Okay. But this person here, okay, wants to make an attack on a specific number of Jewish Christians. I don't know how many he knows, but this is a huge blanket statement that is dangerous. Okay. I sometimes marvel at the pride shown by Jewish Christians as if their status is anything more than a result of Abraham's faith. Okay. So yes, Abraham walked in what? Faith. Okay. Does that mean that Abraham disobeyed Yahweh, that he didn't have a Torah, that he didn't follow the laws of Yahweh? No, he did follow him. He was, um, he was, uh, uh, praised by Yahweh for following his commands. So faith, that faith and trust that Abraham had in Yahweh was followed by his actions, was followed by his works, okay? It didn't save him, but it was the expression of his faith. And so, yes, he walked in faithfulness with uh, Yahweh. We see that here in Genesis chapter 26. Let's go ahead and go there. Amen. So starting in Genesis, Bershit, chapter 26, starting with verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land, aside from the previous famine that had happened in Abraham's days. So Yisak went to King Abimelech of the Philistines to Gerar. Then Yahweh appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land about which I tell you. Live as an outsider in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your seed, I give all these lands, and I will confirm my pledge that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your seed like the stars of the sky, and I will give your seed all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will continually be blessed, because Abraham listened to my voice and kept my charge my commandments, my mitzvot, my decrees, and my Torahot, my Torah, my instructions. In the Hebrew there, it's Torahot. It's the plural form of Torah. It's his instructions. Okay. Did he keep an oral Torah? Absolutely. Does Yahweh change? No, he is a Yahweh that does not change. What was given to Abraham would eventually be given to the nation of Israel. And of course, it would be expanded. There would be more commandments given to the nation of Israel because they're going to be a nation. This is a clan. This is a group, a family group. Okay. So they don't need as many commandments as given at Mount Sinai, but Mount Sinai is the birthing of a nation. So by faith, all right, we know that it was counted as righteousness to Abraham because of his faith. All right. When the covenant was given there between Genesis, Bershit chapter 12, all the way up to 17, he was given promises of the land, okay? And 
that land and many other promises of his seed, and they would be, he, would be a, he would be a father of many nations, which would include the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel would never cease to be a nation that would be part of the promise because his seed would be, uh, you know, go out and bless the land. Okay. So within this covenant promises, we can see that Yahweh promised to Abraham all these things. Okay. Did it depend on Abraham's faith? No, it didn't depend on it. Not at all. Did Abraham have faith? Yes. That's why he could remain a part of it. But when we see, let's go ahead and go to chapter 15 of Genesis. So as we can see here, and Abraham has been walking with Yahweh for well over a decade. He's been walking with him for years and years now. Verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Avram in a vision saying, do not fear Avram, I am your shield, your very great reward. Okay, so he goes on to share how he will, you know, basically have an heir from his own body here. All right, and that. What does it say in here in verse seven? Then he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to give you this land to inherit it, okay? Abraham and his descendants are going to inherit this land and it's not gonna depend on Abraham's faithfulness, okay? So verse eight, so he said, my Lord Yahweh, how will I know that I will inherit it, okay? So he goes and he, gets the animals that are required for this special covenant, okay? And when we see this special covenant, we can see that starting with verse 17, when the sun set and it became dark, behold, there was a smoking oven and a fiery torch that passed between these pieces. So there's blood here. They're walking through the blood. All right. I believe this is an example. Everyone would believe this is Yahweh, but I believe Yeshua and the father walked through the blood. Um, but even if you don't hold to that, Yahweh walked through the blood. Abraham never did. So Yahweh is responsible. This is what you call an unconditional covenant. It's not going to depend on the faithfulness of Abraham. It will happen no matter what Abraham does. Okay. The only uh, commitment that Abraham has to do is he has to circumcise his children. To be a part of this covenant, you have to circumcise your children. Otherwise, they'll be cut off. That's the only responsibility that Abraham has, okay? The actual bringing forth of this promise is by Yahweh alone, and it's eternal. It can never be taken away. Yahweh eternally gave it. It's their inheritance, okay? And it doesn't depend on their faithfulness, okay? Even though he knows that a remnant will always stay faithful. So they will always be a part of the land. They will always be given to it. And so, yes, you can never have a replacement theology by this covenant alone because the land has been promised to Israel. They are the covenant people of Yahweh started right here. This is the root. This is the root of Romans chapter 11. It will be the root will be the patriarchs, the, the covenant relationship that Yahweh has with the patriarchs. That's why he did it with Isaac and Yisak, right? Isaac, Yisak, and Yaakov, okay? Yisak is the Hebrew for Isaac, okay? And then we have Yaakov for Jacob. Those are the patriarchs, the three patriarchs here. This covenant is being firmly established with, and it can never, ever be taken away. So replacement theology is easily disproven by just looking at the Abrahamic covenant. And yes, by faith, it was counted to him as righteousness. And then did that faith not involve him expressing faithfulness? I mean, without faithfulness, you truly don't have faith. So how do we know he had faith? He walked according to Yahweh's Torah, okay? Which those commandments would all be transferred into the Sinai covenant. Okay, because, he, you know, what, what's Abraham going to do? Abraham's not going to be allowed to walk around committing adultery and, you know, not repent, uh, you know, all idolatry and all these other things that are found in the Sinai covenant. They're right there. They're just spoken orally to Abraham. Okay, so was Abraham under the law? Yeah, he was under Yahweh's commandments, under the law. He was under a commitment to follow Yahweh's ways. Okay. Abraham walked by faith. He was faithful 
and walked in the commandments. So this idea, oh yeah, Abraham, you know, didn't have Torah. He just had faith. Okay, that's a total misunderstanding right there. He was given commandments. Okay, you can't have a covenant relationship without Yahweh, without commandments, period. You've got to follow what? His relationship. We know that Abraham wasn't sinless. So he had to walk in repentance, right? That's walking in faith. Repentance is included in walking in faith. So there is a total misunderstanding oftentimes within Western Christianity, within many that say that Abraham didn't have a Torah. He wasn't under the law. That's false. I just read to you Genesis chapter 26, verse five, where he had to follow Torah, Torah oat, the instructions of Yahweh. Okay, which will be the same as Sinai, except even expanded more. Yahweh will add more commandments because we're talking about a nation. But he'll never take away, like Abraham couldn't walk around committing, you know, murder, lying, stealing, killing without consequences, right? If he committed anything, any of these things, he repented and kept walking and kept turning. He wasn't someone that kept violating the commandments of Yahweh. That's how come Yahweh can say he kept my commandments. It's not about walking sinlessly. It's about walking in repentance and walking in faithfulness. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the PowerPoint here. All right. So again, this Western Christian says, I sometimes marvel at the pride shown by Jewish Christians as if their status is anything more than a result of Abraham's faith. No, everything came about because of Yahweh's faithfulness to what? to the covenant that he made with Abraham. It didn't depend on anyone's faith. It depended on Yahweh and his faithfulness, okay? And so, yes, in, the, in that sense, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all the same. We come in through the same way. Abraham had faith. That's how we come in. We come in through that same faith, which means walking also after the commandments because that's an expression of your faith. That means walking after Torah because that's what Yeshua taught. Yeshua taught how to live the Torah correctly. All right, so he says, a godless and rebellious people worse than any Gentile nation because they saw the wonders of God and rejected his prophets and eventually his son, okay? This is straight right here. This type of comment right here is considered anti-Semitic. It spurns anti-Semitism. Oh, those are the Christ killers. They saw the wonders of Yahweh. Well, you know what? It was the leadership that put Yeshua to death, not every single Jew. So notice the blanket statement, the dangerous anti-Semitic tone that is here, that this person, I don't know if he realizes it or not, but it is anti-Semitic because this is, it's these type of statements that help spurn on the persecution of the Jewish people. Okay. As I stated to you earlier, Western Christianity has plenty of blood on its hands uh, by its own leadership. Okay, I can make the same general statement and not everyone would say, well, I don't follow the, the writings of Luther. I don't follow the writings of Calvin, who were very anti-Semitic in many of their uh, ways of speaking of the Jews. Okay, or Augustine or many of others of Western Christianity's leaders. Many people would not hold to those teachings and those ways that those guys spoke of the Jewish people, but they spurned on blood. Okay, killing of Jewish people throughout time. And so, no, this, this statement here is extremely offensive to an ethnic Jew, extremely offensive to an ethnic Jew, and rightfully so, rightfully so. Let me go ahead and just give you a couple statements here by leaders of Western Christianity. Hey, Amen. So I'm just going to give you a few here, but there's plenty I could give you. Uh, but we have John Christentum from 344 to 407 AD, okay? This is definitely after the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church and Rome being so-called the Christian empire now, uh, establishing replacement theology. And what does he say? One of the greatest, it says here, one of the greatest of the church fathers known as the Golden Mouth, a missionary preacher famous for his sermons and addresses. What does he state? The synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts. All right, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuge of bringads and debaucheries and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the 
assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and abyss of perdition. I would say the same thing about their souls. As for me, I hate the synagogue. I hate the Jews for the same reason. Amen. This is a similar way of what this gentleman just spoke about, how they are the most rebellious people of all. This is going to spurn this on, okay? Anti-Semitism. Here, we have St. Augustine. How hateful to me are the enemies of your scripture. How I wish that you would slay them, the Jews, with a two-edged sword, so that there would be none to oppose your word. Gladly would I have them die to themselves and live to you, okay? anti-Semitic to the core here, all right? Jews are no worse sinners or better sinners than any Gentile. The Gentile nations were evil and wicked, did massive evil, okay? It's a matter of man being evil, whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. We are all sinners who need Yeshua, but it's because of covenant promises made to the nation of Israel, all right? The nation of Israel has a calling. This doesn't make a Jew better than a Gentile, but he has a calling. The ethnic Jew has a calling. When I see an ethnic Jew, a believer in Yeshua, that tells me that Yahweh is faithful to his covenant. Right there. He's faith. It's a sign. It doesn't make that Jew better than me or worse than me, but it tells me that Yahweh is faithful to the covenant. As I watch a Jew, a believer in Yeshua, preach the gospel message, amen, he is fulfilling the gift and calling that has been given to his nation. And that gives me hope, amen, that Yahweh will never cast me away, that he will never cast me aside, amen, because if he can cast the Jewish nation aside, he can cast anybody aside. That means he's not faithful to his covenant promises. All right, Peter, the venerable, known as the meekest of men, a model of Christianity, Christian charity. Yes, you Jews, I say, do I address you, you who till this very day deny the Son of God. How long, poor wretches, will you not believe the truth? Truly, I doubt whether a Jew can be really human. I led out from, uh, I'm sorry, I lead out from it dens, den a monstrous animal and show it as a laughing stock in the amphitheater of the world, in the sight of all people. I bring thee forward, thou Jew, thou brutus beast, in the sight of all men. Notice these blanket statements about the Jews, even though at this time there were Jewish believers in Yeshua. Okay, these blanket statements about the Jews. That would be no different than people making blanket statements about Western Christianity, blanket statements about any ethnic group. It's evil to the core to do that. Okay. We got Martin Luther here on the Jews and their lies. What shall we Christians do with this damned, rejected race of Jews since they live among us and we know about their lying and blasphemy and cursing? We cannot tolerate them if we do not wish to share in their lies, curses, and blasphemy. In this way, we cannot quench the inextinguishable fire of divine rage again, nor convert the Jews. We must prayerfully and reverently practice a merciful severity. Perhaps we may save a few from the fire and flames. We must not seek vengeance. They are surely being punished a thousand times more than we might wish them. Let me give you my honest advice. So watch the contradiction here. First, their synagogues should be set on fire and whatever done does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one may ever be able to see a cinder or stone of it. And this ought to be done for the honor of God and Christianity in order that God may see that we are Christians and that we have not wittingly tolerated or approved of such public lying, cursing, and blasphemy of his son and his Christians. Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed, for they perpetuate the same things there 
that they do in their synagogues. For this reason, they ought to be put under one roof or in a stable like gypsies in order that they may realize that they are not masters in our land as they boast, but miserable captives as they complain of incessantly before God with bitter wailing. Thirdly, they should be derived, deprived, I'm sorry, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds in which such idolatry lies, cursing and blaspheming are taught. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach anymore. Fifthly, passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews for they have no business in the rural districts since they are not nobles, nor officials, nor merchants, nor the like. Let them stay at home. If you princes and nobles do not close the road legally to such exploiters, then some troop ought to ride against them for they will learn from this pamphlet what the Jews are and how to handle them and that they ought to be pro uh, not to be protected you ought not, you cannot protect them unless in the eyes of God, you want to share all their abominations. To sum up, dear princes and nobles who have Jews in your dominions, if this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one so that you and we may all be free of this insufferable devilish burden, the Jews. Okay. Let the government deal with them in this respect, as I have suggested, whether the government acts or not, let everyone at least be guided by his own conscience and form for himself a definition or image of a Jew. When you lay eyes or on or think of a Jew, you must say to yourself, alas, that mouth, which I there behold has cursed and excreted and maligned every Saturday, my dear Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed me with his precious blood. In addition, it prayed and pleaded before God that I, my wife and children and all Christians might be stabbed to death and perish, perish miserably. And he himself would gladly do this if he were able in order to appropriate our goods. Okay? Speaking, that's what the Jews wish to do. This propaganda is blasphemous, okay? And these, it's sayings like this that helped spurn Hitler to do what he did. And so we can see residue of this in that statement that that gentleman made, all right, considering the Jews are the most despicable, they're the most, you know, uh, we'll go ahead and reread it so I don't misquote it here. Let's go ahead and go back to it. So as I said here in his statement, he says, a godless and rebellious people worse than any Gentile nation because they saw the wonders of God and rejected his prophets and eventually his son. God chose them to proclaim him to the rest of the world and instead they disobeyed and hoard their limited knowledge of God. God hardened them, used them as dishonorable vessels to accomplish the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. This statement is so misguided. There's so much anti-Semitism here. As you can see, it's very similar it's a very similar saying to the, what? The Western church leadership there that were very anti-Semitic, that had no problem with the government persecuting the Jewish people, okay? Basically kicking them out of the land, All right? Where does it say this in the new covenant? Where did Paul ever encourage this? Where did Paul ever command us to do this? Where did Yeshua ever command us to do this or any new covenant writer command us to go at it this way? to express this, okay? This blanket statement, when there have been hundreds of thousands of Jews, okay, that have believed in Yeshua, walked in his ways, that are a representation that Yahweh still has his covenant promises with Israel. Just look at the new covenant, okay? Let's go ahead and go to Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, starting with verse 30, behold, days are coming. It is a declaration of Yahweh when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It doesn't say with a church, okay? And with the house of Judah, okay? Yehuda, all right? 
not like the covenant I made with their fathers. In the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This was a marriage covenant. Okay, so he's not taking away the covenant promises. He's not doing away with it. He's going to make a new covenant with them because they broke it. He's not abandoning them. Okay, they are still the bride. Verse 32, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Who? The house of Israel. He's bringing both houses together and making them one house. Okay. It is a declaration of Yahweh. I will put my what? My Torah, my law within them. The Sinai covenant, all the laws that are given there, it's going to now be supernaturally being written on their hearts. Okay. Yes, I will write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. He never shows he's going to abandon them. This should be enough. Okay. No longer will each teach his neighbor or each his brother saying, no Yahweh, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. It is a declaration of Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. This is the nation of Israel. Okay. There's coming a time when this will be at its flourishing, when this will be at its summation. Okay? This is why Yeshua has not fulfilled all of the Torah yet. This is all still being done today. And if there are ethnic Jews today, they are a sign of the covenant. They are a sign that Yahweh has not forsaken them. They are a sign of the new covenant. If they are ethnic Jews, believers in Yeshua, they are a sign of the new covenant. Okay, he will forgive their iniquity. That means the nation. Okay, does this erase that you come in to salvation by faith? No, that doesn't erase it at all. That just tells me that there are going to be ethnic Jews that come in and Yeshua will make the nation of Israel out of them. They represent the nation of Israel, the promises, the bride, amen. And us Gentiles that come in, we are part of the grafted in. Okay, we are part of this covenant. And so there is no casting away. There is no supersession of a replacement theology. It's right here. Right here in these passages. Amen. And let's go ahead and go now to Jeremiah 33. Amen. Jeremiah 33, starting with verse 14, I'm going to now begin to go through several passages to show you that Yahweh still has a covenant with Israel. She is still the bride. Okay. There is not something replaced it called the church. It's all one people of Yahweh. Okay. Let's go ahead and begin in verse 14. Behold, days are coming as a declaration of Yahweh when I will fulfill the good word I spoke concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. Notice, not something called the Gentile church. In those days and at that time, I will cause a branch of righteousness to spring up from David. This is Yeshua. And he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. That's because the nation is going to be there. Okay. In those days will Yehuda be saved. Judah will be saved. Okay. Are they saved right now? No, they're not. They will be in the future. And Jerusalem will dwell safely. Okay, and this is the name by which he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. For thus says Yahweh, for David, there will not be cut off a man sitting on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the Levitical Kohanim ever like a man before me to offer burnt offering, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices continually. Okay, in the millennial reign of Yeshua, there will be offerings. We haven't reached that yet because not all of the Torah has been fulfilled. It is all applicable for us today. And there's a lot to discuss on that. I know a lot of questions come up when I say that, okay? We have to take each question at its, at its point and begin to show you why the Torah is still applicable for today, okay? Verse 19, and the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, thus says Yahweh, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night would not be at their appointed time, only then may my covenant be broken with my servant David, that he would not have a son to reign on his throne and the Levitical Kohanim would not be my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levites, 
who minister to me. This is future fulfillment still to come. This is Yeshua ruling and reigning with the Levitical priesthood, walking in righteousness. Okay? They're going to be massive in numbers. Okay? He's going to grow them into that. Verse 23, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, have you noticed what this people have spoken saying? The two families which Yahweh did choose has rejected them. This is exactly what supersessionism is saying, the danger of it. Thus, they despise my people. Didn't I just read that? With the leaders of Western Christianity, uh, when it comes to supersessionism, those who hold to that doctrine, that sect of Western Christianity, Thus says Yahweh, if I have not made my covenant of day and night firm and the fixed patterns ordering in the heavens. Let me go ahead and finish this chapter out here. Hold on one second. I had left out the last verse of the chapter. So verse 25 again. Thus says Yahweh, if I have not made my covenant of day and night firm and fixed, patterns ordering the heavens and the earth only then would i have reject the offspring of Jacob of jacob this is israel and of my servant david so that i would not take from his offspring rulers over the offspring of abraham yasak and Jacob. for i will restore them from their exiles and have compassion on them amen this is still to come okay Yeshua will be ruling and reigning and we will have this. So they have a calling. They have a position. They have a calling to fulfill. Okay. Does Shaul understand this? Yes. That's why he talks about Romans chapter 11. This is why he's dealing with replacement theology, or at least that seed is taking root in the assemblies there in the first century. And he's trying to squash it. He's trying to get rid of it. And yet people reject it. Even today, they reject the words of Paul, and they even twist his words and change his words to mean something that doesn't mean. All right, let's go on. Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 21. The word of Yahweh came to me saying, son of man, as for your kinsmen, your kinsmen, few are fellow exiles and the whole house of Israel. All of them are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem said, keep far away from Yahweh. This land has been given to us for a possession. Therefore, thus says Yahweh Elohim, though I remove them far away among the nations, though I scatter them among the countries, yet for a little while, I was a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore, say, thus says Yahweh Elohim, I will gather you from the peoples and collect you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When they come there, they will remove all of its detestable things and all of its abominations. Then I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh so that they may be able to follow my laws, keep my ordinances and practice them. This is Torah. They will be my people and I will be their God. As for those whose heart walks after the heart of their detestable things and abominations, I will bring their ways upon their heads. It is a declaration of Yahweh Elohim. All right. So he is going to what? Supernaturally change their hearts. All right. By the blood of Yeshua is how this is going to happen through the blood of Yeshua. There are going to be those who will repent and turn and follow Yeshua. He will take them and bring them back to the land. Okay. And they will rule and reign with Yeshua from Jerusalem. Amen. Now let's go ahead and keep going because we've got to go to Ezekiel chapter 16. All right, which is a powerful chapter. All right, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but it's all about the birth of Israel, how they've become a harlot, how they've strayed away, all right, how they've done abominations in Yahweh. But what does he say at the very end? The very end of this chapter, after all of what they've done. Let's go down to verse. Pretty long chapter. We'll start with verse. Uh, 59. For thus says Yahweh Elohim, I will do to you just as you have done since you despise the oath by breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. Moreover, I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. With who? With Israel. This is the new covenant. This is the Hadashah through the blood of Yeshua. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sister. I will give them to you for daughters. Yet not because of your covenant, 
So I will establish my covenant with you and you will know that I am Yahweh. So you will remember, be ashamed and never open your mouth again because of your disgrace. When I have forgiven you of all that you have done, it is a declaration of Yahweh. So this is speaking of Yerushalayim, which represents the nation of Israel. Amen. And he will cleanse her. He will purify her. He will forgive her. This represents the nation of Israel. He will bring the nation, uh, the people back to the land. Amen. Now we have Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Let's begin Let's see here. Let's begin with verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says Yahweh Elohim, I do not do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Yahweh. It is a declaration of Yahweh when I am sanctified in you before their eyes. So no matter what they have done, there will be a group that he will sanctify, all right? And he will bring them out and bring them as the nation of Israel. So he says, for I will take from the nations, gather you out from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. Whose land is this? It is Israel's land forever, forever, amen? Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. What is this? The work of Yeshua the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, amen? And you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my Ruach within you. Then I will cause you to walk in my laws, my Torah. So you will keep my rulings and do them. Then you will live in the land that I gave to your fathers. You will be my people and I will will be your God. So I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call you from, from the grain and make it plentiful and so forth. It goes for this is the future of Israel. This is why replacement theology is so evil. Amen. That particular doctrine, the doctrine is false. Okay. And of course, Western Christianity often, often, not always, but often teachers like to take this and just put this on the Gentiles. Oh, this is the Gentile church. They try to uh, basically uh, spiritualize everything, okay, in order to get their doctrine the way they want. They got to spiritualize Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, the nation of Israel. They're the new Israel. That's what was really brought forth in the fourth century by the Roman Catholic Church, okay? This is a false doctrine, a false teaching. It violates the Abrahamic covenant, and it causes you to twist many passages, Okay? And it brings forth anti-Semitic terms, anti-Semitic teachings and sayings, okay? which can turn into literally killing of Jews. It spurns it on. It has all throughout history. So as we can see, there's much error, all right, that is being said by this Western Christian here when he states that they are godless and rebellious people worse than any Gentile nation because they saw the wonders of God and rejected his prophets and eventually his son. God chose them to proclaim him to the rest of the world, and instead they disobeyed and hoarded their limited knowledge of God. Did Yahweh already know this? Yeah. But is he going to forgive them and bring them back? Yes. Did he use them as a dishonorable vessel? Uh, yes, he did, in a sense, because the nation of Israel, the leaders, are the ones that were, what, spurning the people on and setting the tone for the entire nation. So every time that Yahweh destroyed the temple, okay, it was to discipline them. It was never to utterly forsake them, because, yes, their leadership had become so rebellious, all right, and not following the ways of Yahweh that he wanted to start over. And that's what, exactly what happened in 70 CE, okay? The leadership rejected Yeshua. The people, many of the people were not, okay? Not saying all the people didn't reject Yeshua, but many did, and many accepted him. But the leadership refused. So what does Yahweh do? He destroys the temple. He will start over. He will bring them eventually back from the land because it doesn't depend on their faithfulness, right? The land belongs to them because of the covenant of Abraham. It 
will forever be that way. And there will always be a remnant of believers. So he will start over. Yeshua will return and gather up all of Israel, all of the 12 tribes. All right. And they will become believers in him. We have the 144,000 that will preach the gospel message. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation. This is all part of Yahweh's plan. Okay. And so let's go ahead now. Uh, well, let's go to the next slide because there's more. All right. This Western Christian says, oh, what a shame. Okay. I have zero desire to be grafted into Abraham's tree as a Jew, but only as a gra grateful child of God, who because of God's love for me is now heir to the promise given to Abraham, who was not a Jew under the law, but a true man of faith, who unlike the Jews obeyed God, even when it made no sense. Notice the blanket statements. Notice the errors that are going on here. I just showed you not too long ago, Genesis 26, verse five, he followed Yahweh's commands and his Torah, oh, his instructions, his Torah. Okay. So was he, you know, at the Sinai covenant? No. But was he under the law? Yeah. He was under God's instructions, Yahweh's instructions, his laws, and he obeyed them. So notice that this person doesn't understand covenants, doesn't understand the scriptures. Okay. And so, and he's making blanket statements when we have Paul and so many others who are ethnic Jews that they understood Yeshua. They understood his ways. All right. Yaakov says tens of thousands were coming to Yeshua and they were what zealous for the Torah. And then what did Paul do? He showed them that he still followed the law of Moshe in chapter 21. Okay. He followed Yaakov's instructions and still showed everyone he was a true follower of the law of Moshe. Go to Acts chapter 25, verse 7 and 8, and even though he's falsely accused okay, of not following Torah and teaching everyone to keep Torah, he was falsely accused. Paul, by his own testimony, says, I have done nothing all right, to the offense of the Torah, of my Jewish people, the temple, or Caesar. Okay, So yes, by his own profession, he kept following the Torah and teaching others. Otherwise, Paul's a liar there in Acts chapter 25. So the gross misunderstanding here, okay, the pulling out of context, taking a truth and twisting it here, all right, uh, is what this person is doing. And it's probably because of what he has learned throughout the years through replacement theology, okay? It's a misunderstanding here. And this is a total drifting away from the truth of even what the words of Paul, look at, he calls it Abraham's tree. Okay, what he's referring to is Romans chapter 11. So let's talk a little bit about Romans 9, 10, and 11 now. Okay, 9, 10, and 11. We'll get into a little bit more what he means by according to the spirit and the letter. But let's go to Romans chapter 9 through 11 and just touch on some things here. All right, so we are in Romans chapter 9 here. 9 through 11 is the sermation. I mean, it's like the high point of the entire letter of Paul. Uh, because he's trying to make sure that replacement theology gets uprooted and, and thrown into the sea, basically. I mean, it's beginning. The seeds are there. It's beginning to take root. That's why he's talking about it. It's because it's there. And so what does he say? I tell you the truth in Messiah. I do not lie. My conscience assuring me in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that my sorrow is great and my anguish in my heart unending. For I would pray that I myself were cursed, banished from Messiah for the sake of my people my own flesh and blood, who are Israelites, to them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the Torah and the temple service and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs uh, and from them, according to the flesh, the Messiah, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. This is the present tense. They still belong to them. Okay, but he has unbelieving fellow ethnic brothers and sisters, okay? And so his heart goes out to them because it belongs to them, but they're rejecting it. Is this all of Israel? No. Is the Israel leadership doing it right now? Yes, they are. This does not make up all of Israel, nor do you see, oh, it used to belong to them, but now God has taken it away. Yahweh has cast it off now because of what Yeshua did. You don't get any of that here. You don't get any replacement theology here, okay? And so, yes, they still belong to them, according to Paul. All right. Now, let's go ahead and go to, well, let's go ahead. 
uh, verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all of those who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's seed. Rather, your seed shall be called through Yisak. In other words, you got to believe in the promised one, okay? So just being an ethnic Jew does not automatically make you in. But if you are an ethnic Jew and you believe in Messiah, you represent the nation. You represent the promises there. You are part of the bride. You represent the bride, which is Israel. Okay, so it's not though Yahweh's word has failed. Okay, but it's how someone enters into the covenant relationship through faith. Okay, that is how everyone comes in. That's where the ground is level. Okay, whether Jew or Gentile, you come in by faith in Yeshua alone. Okay, no one gets a pass. No one gets extra privilege. So everyone is on equal ground there. That's where this person who made those comments is totally, you know, misunderstanding the scriptures. Okay. He's making a truthful statement that a Jew is not better than a Gentile when it comes to coming into the covenant. All right. We all come in through the same door. Narrow is the door. There's only one way. And that is through the blood of Yeshua, through the work of Yeshua, whether Jew or Gentile. But if you're an ethnic Jew, do you have a calling and the gift? given to you and promises that by Yahweh? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's when you, when we look to an ethnic Jew that is following Yeshua, that gives us the hope. Yahweh doesn't forsake. Yahweh keeps his promises. Amen. All right, let's go on to chapter 11, because I'm trying to go fast here, uh, but there's just so much to talk about. So chapter 11 of Romans. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he knew beforehand. Or do you not know what the scriptures say about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Yahweh, they have killed your prophets. They have destroyed your altars. I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept uh, for myself, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So in the same way, also at this present time, there has come to be a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. All right. So the fact that there are true Israelites still believing in Yeshua has nothing to do with their ethnic blood. That's what he means by works. These works that they did, that they created in the first century, these traditions of men, showed their bloodline. Oh, we're the bloodline. We're the seed of Abraham. So we, we are here because of our bloodline. We get the promises and everything just because of our bloodline. Okay? They had fallen into a uh, false teaching of bloodline. It is by faith and by grace that you are saved. And the fact that there are Jews that understand this and reject the teachings that were held by the nation helps you to see that, okay? That Israel is still Yahweh's people. He has reserved for himself a remnant. And this is all throughout time, this has been this way, okay? So notice the context, it's about Israel. Israel is the context here. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but the elect obtained it, okay? And the rest were hardened. So who are the elect? The elect are what? Ethnic Jews who are followers of Yeshua and Gentiles. Amen. They make up the Israel of God. The elect all throughout the Tanakh passages is Israel. So he's not rejecting all of Israel. He's rejecting the Israelites who have rejected him. But those Israelites who accepted Yeshua, they are the elect. They make up the Israel of God, the Israel of Yahweh. That means there's a national establishment and promises made still to the nation of Israel, okay? That the land still belongs to them in Paul's eyes. It will never be cast away, all right? And then what does it say? Um, the elect have obtained it, okay? So this is something within inside of Israel and the rest were hardened, okay? The unbelieving Israelites were hardened, okay? That doesn't mean that all of Israel is not going to be saved, that Israel has lost its place, its mission, its calling. 
just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes not to see and ears not to hear until this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bent their back continually. Okay. If they want to reject Yeshua, let them go. Let them go. Leave them alone. Just let them go. Yahweh will take care of them. But there are true ethnic Jews that believe in Yeshua. They make up Israel. They make up the people of Yahweh. They are the ones that the, that the holders of the land. Verse 11. That I say then, they did not stumble. So as to fall, did they? May it never be. But their false step, salvation has come. I'm sorry, by their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealous. How do we provoke Israel to jealousy? We follow the Torah. The Torah is still viable for all believers. It always has been. Okay. And so we follow Yeshua. We follow his Judaism. Okay. His Torah observance, because he is what? The king of Israel, the king and the lion he is the lion of Judah. And so it says, now, if their transgressions leads to riches for the world and their loss riches for the Gentiles, then how much more their fullness, amen? When they turn and repent and cry out to Yeshua, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, which they will do one day. One day they will cry out that, amen? The leadership of Israel will cry out that. All of Israel will cry out that, all right? And Yeshua will return. That didn't happen in 70 CE. All right. So he says, but I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles insofar as I'm an emissary to the Gentiles. Um, I spotlight my ministry. If somehow I might provoke to jealousy my own flesh and blood and save some of them. For if their rejection leads to reconciliation and the world of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Okay. They have a mission. They have a mission. What did Yeshua say in John chapter four? He said, salvation is of the Jews. He told the Samaritan woman that salvation is of the Jews. Okay. By Yeshua's own words. And so no replacement theology, supersessionism is an evil doctrine. Okay. Let's go on. If the first fruit is holy, so is the whole batch of dough. This is speaking of the nation of Israel. They are still Yahweh's people, called and separated unto him. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. What is the root from which the nation sprung forth? It is the patriarchs, the covenant of the patriarchs, Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov. It is the Abrahamic covenant. That is the root. Okay. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, so what type of tree is this? It's the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is considered an olive tree. It's not Abraham's tree. It's the nation of Israel's tree with the root being the Abrahamic covenant. From the Abrahamic covenant comes the nation of Israel. Okay. Comes Yeshua. Comes salvation is of the Jews. And what happens to the wild olive branches? They are grafted into the nation of Israel. Israel is the bride. We're grafted in among the natural olive branches. These are ethnic Jews who believe in Yeshua. All right, so let's go ahead and go to show you how Israel is an olive tree. Amen. So in Jeremiah, Yermiyahu chapter 11, we see that the word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the people of Yehuda and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, so we're speaking to Yehuda and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we go down to verse 16, where it says, What is my beloved doing in my house as she does evil schemes with many? Can't holy meat prevent your disaster? So you rejoice, so you may rejoice. Yahweh called your name a leafy olive tree, beautiful with well-formed fruit, with the noise of a great tumult. He has set it on fire and its branches are broken. 
For Yahweh Zavaot, who planted you, has pronounced evil against you because of the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Yehuda, which they have done to themselves, provoking me, my uh, offering sacrifices to Baal. Moreover, Yahweh gave me knowledge of it, and I knew it. Then you showed me their deeds. So he's using this expression here of an olive tree, okay, to what? To Israel, okay? He's setting it on fire. He's disciplining Israel right now. He's setting this tree on fire and disciplining her, okay? And then in what? Chapter 9, we're talking about the olive tree, amen, that are believers in Yeshua. It is the nation of Israel that are believers in Yeshua. This, this olive tree that is formed in Romans chapter 11, Paul is establishing the root as the covenant of Abraham. The actual tree is Israel. Okay, because Israel is known as an olive tree in the scriptures. Okay, and so, yes, it's not the tree of Abraham. See how the person has to twist the meaning of it to fit their theology? It's the nation of Israel. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint. Well, actually, before going back to the PowerPoint, we need to continue with uh, Romans chapter 11 here because this is the high point of Paul's letter, totally destroying any type of supersessionism or replacement theology. Amen. And so we can see here, but if some of the branches, verse 17, were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became a partaker of the root of the olive tree with its richness, richness do not boast against the branches. Okay, this is something supersessionism does. They boast against the Jewish people. That's exactly what this other person was doing. The very thing that he thought the Jewish Christians were doing, which I don't deny that probably some of them do do that. All right, we all have problems with pride. Even Gentiles have problems with pride. Okay, but we also aren't supposed to boast against the branches, which is what this gentleman was doing. Okay. By his comments and his remarks, that's exactly what he's doing because he's perpetuating a false teaching. So let's go ahead and uh, continue. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. Now, this is the Abrahamic covenant, okay? This is the Abrahamic covenant because it brought forth the nation of Israel, which brought forth what? Yeshua. All right, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. True enough. They were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, ethnic Jews, neither will he spare you. Notice then the kindness and severity of God. Severity towards those who fell, but God's kindness towards you. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And they also, this is the danger of replacement theology because it could lead you into be cutting off because you're boasting about the branches, amen, and you're not walking in faithfulness by doing this. So this is a dangerous teaching. It's caused much anti-Semitic, uh, actual uh, anti-Semitic acts by people. Let's go on. Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off of that which by nature is a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cult of elevated tree, the nation of Israel, how much more will you, will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Okay. The nation of Israel. Israel is the bride. Okay. Let's continue. Verse 25. For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant in this mystery. Okay, those who hold to replacement theology, unfortunately, have become ignorant to this mystery. Lest you be wise in your own eyes, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's why we know the tree is Israel. The natural olive branches, the tree, it comes from the covenant of Abraham, which is the root. Okay, context is king. And in this way, all Israel will be saved doesn't mean every Israelite will be saved because not all Israel is Israel, but those who have faith will make up the Israel and Yahweh, Yeshua will cause their seed to multiply as the sand of the sea. 
Okay. It is written, the deliverer shall come out of Zion. He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Who? The nation of Israel. You can't have a replacement theology. Okay. Another reason why preterism and some of these other teachings are erroneous. They're just false. Okay. Because their foundation is replacement theology. All right. Um, verse 28, concerning the good news, they are hostile for your sake, but concerning chosenness, election, the nation of Israel is Yahweh's elect. They are loved on account of the fathers for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So it's not about pride, right? Christian Jews or Jewish Christians. It's not about pride. It's about their calling. They have a calling that is irrevocable. And that is to stand as ethnic Jews, followers of Yeshua, okay, who love Gentiles, who teach them the ways of Torah, all right, who don't, who don't show favoritism. They stand, the ethnicity of them stand as what? As a sign that Yahweh does not forsake his covenant, that Yahweh is a God of covenants and he keeps his promises, no matter if they have a history of being faithless, he will be faithful. So, for just as you once were disobedient, speaking to Gentiles, to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, in like manner, these also have been now disobedient in the result that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has shut up all hidden disobedience so that he might show mercy on all, the Jewish nation and the nations of the world. Okay, this does not get rid of the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation still stands and all the other nations, okay, will what? Become obedient, okay? They will become obedient to Gentiles that are within them. Doesn't mean all Gentiles will, right? It's the same thing. We got to be fair on both sides. Not all Gentiles will be saved. Not all Israelites will be saved. But the fact that there are Israelites being saved shows that Yahweh has not forsaken his bride. The bride is Israel. Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree, which is Israel. Okay. And so he is able to show mercy on both sides this way. Oh, the depths and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Verse 33, how unsearchable are your judgments? are his judgments and how un, incomprehensible his ways for who has known the mind of Yahweh or who has been considered his counselor or who has first given to him that it shall be repaid to him for through him. I'm sorry, for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Paul is destroying replacement theology here. Chapters nine and through 11, destroy it. But those who hold to replacement theology have to twist the words of Paul to make their theology fit, okay? And they continue to do that all throughout the Bible. Let's go ahead, go back to the PowerPoint. All right, back to the saying of this gentleman where he goes on to say that I am thankful that Jesus has rendered the law as useless and obsolete to his children so that they can now walk according to the spirit instead of the letter. Wow, what a misunderstanding of scripture. Okay, and I'm sure that's just what this person was taught. Okay, when you've been taught a misunderstanding of scripture over and over, over again and you keep establishing it, uh, it's going to show, right? He can't stay consistent with scripture with this. So I pray that he will repent and turn, amen, from this falsehood here because he's going right against the words of Yeshua in Matthew chapter five, verses 17 through uh, 19, that not one jot or till the law will pass away until all is fulfilled, that all is fulfilled. The very law is what? The laws of the kingdom. It's how you live in the kingdom. It's what Yeshua spent three years teaching us how to do how to live the Torah, how to live the law, because that's what we're going to need to live in this kingdom, right? Every time he talked about the Jews being scattered and bringing them back, just go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 11. I talked about it in Jeremiah 33, verses um, uh, 14 through 26, all right? And then you've got it in Ezekiel chapter 11, 
chapter 36. All right, when he scatters them and brings them back together, sprinkles clean water on them, gives them a new heart, forgives them of their sins, what are they doing? They're keeping the Torah. They're following the laws of Moshe. Amen. And why is that? Because it's being supernaturally written on their heart. They're walking in belief and not unbelief. The only way the law of Moshe becomes death to you, a ministry of death, is when you walk in unbelief. Then it's a ministry of death. Okay. When you walk by the spirit, it becomes what? The laws of the kingdom to you. You will follow it. Yahweh told Israel, you must follow these or I will curse you. I will scatter you. Yahweh gave the Torah to Israel as a gift of grace so that they would know right from wrong. So they would be taught what happens to the disobedient ones that don't follow Yahweh. They will be put to death. There is a curse on them. So here he, you know, he tries to make this statement, though it's extremely false in how he's interpreting it. I'm thankful that Jesus has rendered the law as useless and obsolete to his children so that they can now walk according to the spirit instead of the letter. What's the spirit going to tell you to do? Follow Torah. He's going to empower you. The law is being written on your heart. So are you going to keep Sabbath? Yes. Are you going to love your neighbor as yourself? Yes. Are you going to show no partiality to whether you're a Jew or Gentile? Yes. That's what the Torah teaches you. The Torah teaches you how to love, how to treat others. All throughout the Torah, it's said to treat the native, the outsider, I'm sorry, the outsider, the stranger, like you do a native. Do not show partiality. Do not oppress the outsider. It says that all throughout the Torah. So walking according to the letter, yes, he's quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 3 here. It is a ministry of death, right? Only for those who don't put their faith and trust in Yeshua, okay? The letter kills because it has no power to save you. The spirit is the giver of life. It is the spirit of Messiah. And when you have received the spirit, you will what? Walk in the Torah. So there's a grave misunderstanding. He can't stay consistent. He doesn't understand Paul's letter here. Paul's letter is not a theological essay. It's based off the Tanakh. It's based off the Torah. You have to have understanding of covenants and Torah to understand this gentleman's statement here. And I just showed you for the last hour and a half, scripture after scripture after scripture, how Yahweh is faithful to Israel. They will all keep the Torah and it's going to be done when Yeshua returns. It's going to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. The spirit is going to write it on their hearts. Amen. And all throughout the millennial reign, there's going to be offerings being done. And there's much to say about that. They're the shadow pointing to the reality. They're not the reality, but they're a teaching tool. They teach you the reality of Yeshua. And that's still going to be done in the millennial reign. Okay. It's still going to honor Yahweh. Paul says that the law is holy, righteous, and good. All of it is. So there's nothing wrong with doing it. The Sinai covenant and the new covenant can coexist together side by side. Amen. They don't contradict one another. The Sinai covenant points you to Yeshua. Yeshua's covenant is one of the spirit. The Sinai covenant is one of the flesh. Yes, eventually there will be no more animal offerings after what? The millennial reign of Yeshua. After the white throne judgment is when we are all fully living in the new covenant. So the new covenant has broken into our existence now. Okay, and it's increasing, but it's not at its fullness yet. It won't be at its fullness till after the white throne judgment. So the Sinai covenant and the what Brit Hadashah walk hand in hand. They have specific purposes and meanings to them. Don't confuse the two as this gentleman is doing here. Okay, let's go on. He says, I'm thankful that according to 1 Corinthians 10, I am part of a new people he has created. See, this is replacement theology right here. This becomes anti-Semitic when carried out to its fullness. I am a part of the new people he has created. Okay. So what are the new people he has created? Okay. They are both Jew and Gentile in Messiah Yeshua. They make up the Israel of God. They are part of the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians chapter two. All right. The Israel of God is Galatians 6.16. We are grafted into the olive tree, which is Israel in Romans chapter 11. Okay, this is the new people of God, but it doesn't replace Israel. That's what he's suggesting by his comment here. But notice 1 Corinthians 10. Do 
Notice 1 Corinthians 10. This is the words of Paul. He's speaking to both Jew and Gentile in what? Current Corinth. He says, for I do not want you to be ignorant brothers and sisters that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Who are our fathers? All of the Israelites and Gentiles and that who came out of Egypt by faith and by grace. Amen. And came into a wedding covenant and they became the Israel of God. They became the nation of Israel. Jew and Gentile call them our fathers because we've been grafted into Israel. They were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were all immersed into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Messiah. That is Yeshua. Yeshua was in the desert. Okay. The same way Yeshua delivered Jew and Gentile out of Egypt is how he's doing it today. And he formed the nation of Israel. Israel is the bride. It's consistent with scripture. Jew and Gentiles are grafted or Gentiles are grafted into Israel. The ethnic Jew shows the promises of Yahweh are irrevocable. And we Gentiles are grafted in showing that the blessings have gone out to all the nations. Okay. Together, we show the fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham, but you can't take away the nation of Israel and just call this some type of separate thing called the church. It can't happen. The word church in the Greek comes from kuriakon, something that belongs to the Lord. All right. Ecclesia is assembly or congregation. When Yeshua said, upon this rock, I'll build my ecclesia, he did not say church. Okay. He was speaking of the Israel of God, the nation of Israel. That is his ecclesia and those who have faith that will make up the Israel of God. All right. And it is ethnic Jews and Gentiles together. Okay. And ethnic Jews have a mission. They have a calling and a gifting. They have the promises to the land. All right. There's going to be 12 tribes living in the land. There are special privileges they do have. All right. It doesn't make them better. Doesn't make them uh, better than Gentiles. Doesn't make them uh, more privileged in a sense. Uh, to where, you know, how you get into the kingdom or not, they have a responsibility. They have responsibilities that might be different than Gentiles at times, okay? Depending on when we go through the covenant and we go through the commandments and everything and we look and see and we talk about those things. Uh, but no, we're all, when it comes to the cross, we all come in the same way, okay? And we don't show favoritism to one another, but the land belongs to ethnic Israel, all right? And they have certain callings and giftings that they are supposed to do and the gentiles have their own calling and giftings that they are called to do okay that is the sovereign choice of yahweh and so yes it says in verse five nevertheless god was not pleased with them for they were struck down in the desert jew and gentile okay so yeah, is he making these new people yes okay but it's made up of what jew and gentile amen in messiah yeshua they were disobedient in the desert. Now we're going to have an Israel of God that is obedient, a nation of Israel with Gentiles together. Okay. And so as we come down here, uh, let's see. All right. Verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jewish or Greek people or to the community of what or god's community it it literally says in the greek theos ecclesia okay it's not church it is the assembly of god which is the assembly of yeshua which is the israel of god amen which is the nation of israel but we are to give no offense to either one right we know that jews have their calling their gift and calling they have to do what they have to do gentiles have to do what they have to do we give no offense to either side Okay, I don't hold a Jewish Christian higher than me or anything. I just know he has a calling and a purpose in his life to represent the, the ethnicity part of the seed of Abraham and the promises to the land. He has to represent that. I represent the blessings that go out to the nations. Okay, so there's a misrepresentation going on in this person's comment that you're seeing in my PowerPoint. Let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint. So as you can see, he continues to misstep and misinterpret scripture, says, I'm thankful that according to the 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm part of a new people that he has created, rooted in the inherited promise to Abraham. Well, if you truly believe that, then you would know that the nation of Israel is not forsaken, that supersessionism is false, and that you are dangerously walking that line of helping people to be anti-Semitic towards ethnic Jews. Okay, that's the result that happens over and over again that people who hold to supersessionism. And so again, he, you know, he tries to quote 1 Corinthians 10.32. We read it, give no offense either to Jews or, or to the Greeks or to the church of God, which that's a false interpretation or misinterpretation. It is the ecclesia of theos, of God. It is the assembly of God, which is always Israel. They are the elect, amen. And the fact that we have a chosen remnant by the sovereign choice of Yahweh shows you that the nation of Israel will never cease to exist. And the scriptures over and over again say that they will come back to the land, we'll all follow Torah together, the law of Moshe, amen. So again, it's these misunderstandings here, this mistranslation that keeps throwing people off and why he perpetuates this misstep. So it says the church of God is the new creation of God. Here's supersessionism right here. Here's replacement theology right here, because you're using this word church, okay, which again is perpetuating a false teaching, a false understanding, all right, and the Israel that Yahweh is creating still makes up ethnic Jews. It's the new covenant, yes, but it's made with Israel, and they are still going to be in the land, so that's the Abrahamic covenant, amen, and they are still called to circumcise their children. So that we can see a difference between a Jew and a Gentile to know that the promises of God are irrevocable. Okay. It doesn't give someone special extra, you know, a, a way of entering the kingdom. No, it's all by faith in Yeshua, by grace. All right. So he says, I pray that by God's grace, we will not follow in the Jewish footsteps of disobedience and disloyalty to God. No, we will follow in the Jews who followed Yeshua who represent the Israel of God. Amen. And we will follow Yeshua who will raise up proper leadership and create the Israel that will be in the land. And one day all of Israel will be saved, as it says in Romans chapter 11, which makes up what? The entire olive tree of ethnic Jews and Gentiles. That's why it says all of Israel will be saved. Israel is the bride. Okay. So I pray that we will proclaim Jesus as Lord of Lord and King of Kings over all peoples and nations. That's exactly the calling of the nation of Israel. Okay, that's their calling. The Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He will rule and reign from Jerusalem. Amen. The Levitical priesthood will be operating all throughout the millennial reign, doing offerings. Just look in Zechariah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, 4. Amen. I already showed you Jeremiah 33 verses 14 through 26. Okay. So again, this person, there's a twisting here. There's a constant twisting and a misunderstanding of scripture. So the following entries uh, are from the Oxford Universal English Dictionary. The word church. Okay. Churchy. All right. It comes from uh, basically Kirk the Northern English and Scottish form of church in all its senses, all right? So let's start by defining the word church. It comes from the old English and German word pronounced kirchi in Scotland. It was kirk. The early Greek word kyriakos or kyriakon would be where the word church comes from. The meaning of kyriakos is understood by its root, kurios, which means Lord. The Greek word ecclesia in Yeshua's day meant assembly or congregation. Ecclesia is used to translate Ada and Kahal from the Hebrew meaning congregation and assembly. This is always when we're talking about Yahweh's people or Yeshua's people, it's talking about Israel. When he said that to the 12 apostles right there, upon this rock, I will build my Ecclesia and the gates of hell will not stand against it. He wasn't using the word church. Okay, Ecclesia means assembly, congregation. The word church comes in later when Gentiles want to bring it in to show separation from the nation of Israel. They purposely want to bring this word in. And that's why you see it in the lexicons the way you do now. It's by Gentile theologians putting it in there. Okay. 
first you have to have replacement theology established in the fourth century. And then after, you know, a thousand CE, uh, you know, once you get into the 10th, 11th, 12th century, you start seeing this English word church just kind of working its way into the translations little by little. All right. So Kyriakos uh, church, meaning pertaining to the Lord, it refers to something that pertains or belongs to the Lord. The Greek Kyriakos eventually came to be used in old English form as Circe and then church and eventually church in its trans uh, traditional pronunciation. A church then is correctly something that pertains or belongs to the Lord. So in a sense, that's not wrong, but it's using it's being used wrong uh, in the scriptures. It's not ecclesia. Okay, it is something that belongs to the Lord, just like. The word kyriakos or kyriakon is used when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, okay? The Passover Seder was something that belonged to Yeshua, belonged to Yahweh, all right? Or when we say that uh, Yochanan was in the spirit on the Lord's day, kyriakos there, okay? Uh, something that's a day that belongs to the Lord. That's where you would get the word church from, but ecclesia is not. Ecclesia is a general Greek word for assembly. It doesn't even have to be um, a Jewish assembly. It can be a, P a pagan Greek assembly. In general, it, that's just the general use of the term Ecclesia. Okay. But when it's talking about the Lord, when it's talking about Yeshua, all right, it's talking about Israel. The nation of Israel is the bride all throughout the Tanakh, the assembly of Yahweh. Did he... Did he get rid of unbelieving Jews all throughout the Tanakh? Yeah, he disciplined them. He protected the remnant. All right. You, you had prophets and all of them that were uh, true followers of Yahweh and they kept the Torah. So there's much to be talked about in this uh, arena about Ecclesia. It's not church. Okay. Because of the weight and meaning that the word church carries with it in the eyes of Western Christianity. That's the danger. Amen. So the Greek word ecclesia in Yeshua's day meant assembly or congregation. Ecclesia is used to translate Ada and Kahal from the Hebrew meaning congregation and assembly. Ecclesia was never translated as church in the Tanakh, even though Israel is Yahweh's betrothed and his assembly or congregation. Amen. So I hope that in this teaching, I mean, I've, I've gone almost two hours now. I never plan to go this long, but because of uh, what this gentleman brought out and the misunderstanding, I thought it'd be necessary to do a teaching on this. Okay. And I didn't even, I'm just scratching the surface. I mean, there were so many passages that were brought out that were brought in a way that were twisted to mean something. I mean, you can't, what happens is people just quote scriptures all right. And they'll say, see, look, it just says it there in black and white. No, scriptures have a context. And if you don't understand the context, everyone's going to have a different interpretation of the scriptures. So this gentleman here who believes in supersessionism, the way he was expressing it here, definitely defines supersessionism. Uh, he goes on to quote more scripture. And of course, all he's doing is quoting scripture. I can walk through those scriptures and, and teach you uh, the proper context and meaning of each one of those scriptures, and it supports my view. It supports that Israel is the bride, that Gentiles are grafted into Israel. We're all part of the bride. We're all citizens of, the, of Israel. Amen. We're citizens of the new covenant. Amen. And though ethnic Israel has possession of the land, we all will come to Jerusalem because we're citizens of the bride. Jerusalem is actually the bride uh, spoken of in Revelation chapters. Uh, you know, when you start with verse 19, uh, chapter 19 and go all the way to the end, you know, in chapter 21, it will tell you that Jerusalem, new Jerusalem is the bride. Okay. And that's, it'll have 12 gates with the 12 names of the 12 tribes on there. It'll have the apostles names as the foundation. So this is all pointing towards Israel is the bride. Gentiles are allowed to come in and be grafted in and be a part of the covenant. All right. And this helps to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant where Abraham, uh, the blessing will come to his seed. That's why Yeshua said salvation is of the Jews and then out to the nations. And in this way, all of the earth will be blessed. Amen. So yes, uh, 
supersessionism and replacement theology is a uh, very dangerous teaching to sit under and be a part of, and to especially to try and teach to people. Uh, you will be held in high accountability to Yahweh for that false teaching. And so it will perpetuate anti-Semitism and the hatred of the Jews, okay, which will bring massive curses upon people who claim to be believers in Yeshua and do this teaching. All right, I'll let Yahweh be the final judge. I know that there are people that hold to this doctrine, uh, but uh, don't hold to it firmly um, and have just a misunderstanding. They walk in ignorance, but they hold that Yeshua is their only savior. He is the only way in. Amen. And so I would still call them fellow brothers and sisters with me because of their foundational understanding of what salvation is. But if they are teaching replacement theology and perpetuating that, that becomes a very dangerous situation for them. And I'll let Yahweh decide that. I will stay far from it. I will stay far from it. I will help to try and bring truth to where that misunderstanding is. I will stand up for the gospel message, the truth of the gospel, the truth of Yeshua and his bride. Amen. So I hope this was helpful to you. I know this was long, but I believe it was extremely beneficial for those who make it through the entire teaching. And so until we meet again, everyone, Shalom.